these two newlyweds are permitted to get like pretty frisky with one another on they screen. They ask each other if they're hungry. In a very mm. suggestive manner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was as horny as you could get in yeah. 1934. <laughs> yeah. Would you like some lunch? <laughs> yes. In 2017, Universal Studios announced the birth of a new shared universe of monster movies, bringing their classic horror icons into the contemporary franchise film landscape. But after the critical and financial failure of its first installment, the project was indefinitely abandoned. Now, in 2022, the powers that be have called upon one pulp horror devotee and one snarky film critic to unearth the concept. I'm Dylan Roth. And I'm Dalton DeShane. Are you afraid of the dark universe? Welcome back to Are You Afraid of the Dark Universe, the podcast where we attempt to resurrect Universal Studios' failed cinematic universe of monster movies, one pitch at a time. I'm one of your hosts, Dylan Roth. I'm the other one of the hosts, Dalton DeShane. And together we've been building out the dark universe into an ongoing narrative to rival the MCU. Last episode... Surpass, I would surpa say. Yeah, I mean, and I think we've succeeded. Yes. I mean, at least one film critic thinks that this one's better. Hey, really? Oh, is that you? It's better be me. Okay. <laughs> I, thought, I thought someone had, like, reached out. But... No. Okay. <laughs> the film critic that matters most to me personally uh, and some... me you're my favorite film critic too oh thanks to, i didn't i didn't uh this is all written down this is, in this our is script. all part yeah. of the script dylan yeah. actually wrote the intro for this one and <laughs> had me say all this stuff so that's right last episode dalton pitched me their surprising slasher flick the bride and frankenstein and next episode i'll be walking them through my grand odyssey dracula lives but in between our own canonical installments We've been inviting our favorite storytellers into our office to plumb the depths of the Universal Pictures catalog for other properties to potentially remake and fold into our continuity. We got a big library at our disposal, and damn it, we're going to use it. That's right. You know what? Because we're we're now, we're so close to being at, like, the end of Phase 2. The Dark Legion 2 is only a couple of months away now. Uh, I know. I, I know. know. <laughs> so much fucking work to do. Trust uh, me, I know. <laughs> yeah, there's a reason we only do the full cast episodes once a year. It's going to be good. It's going to be really good. It's going to be really fun. Um, I'm, I'm just stealing myself for it now. Yes. <laughs> but uh, for today, we have a guest who is here to pitch uh, a potential remake of another, like, really classic universal horror movie. Go back to 1934. Mm -hmm. It's a Lugosi. It's a Karloff. Our guest today has a long list of credits. She's the author of numerous essays, poetry collections, narrative video games, and the upcoming photo book, LAN Party. She's a prolific poster and Twitch streamer and was the features and guides editor at fanbyte.com, where she hosted such podcasts as The K-Hole and Friends Reunion. And, incidentally, helped to launch the careers of a number of entertainment writers, including yours truly. Please welcome to the Dark Universe, Merit K. Hey, thanks for having me. I, um... Yeah, I thought this was like a natural next step. You know, I just left my job. And so now I'm trying to get into the movie business. This, this is honestly like, a big step up. Yeah, to movie yeah, production. Yeah, yeah I, know, I, mean, I know. Things go well. This We have we have an astronomical budget. Yeah, that's for this what I've project. heard. Yeah. So, uh, really excited. So we're excited to see what you have for us in terms of uh, the Black Cat is a universal classic that neither Dalton nor I was all that familiar with. Yeah, this is our first outside pitch of like a classic era universal movie. Right, because um, previously we have had a video game pitch. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a, a pitch about a competing product, uh, sort of opposition research. The where League Calvin of Extraordinary Gentlemen. The Extraordinary Gentlemen mm -hmm. uh, requel. And then uh, Maddie Luchansky and Jaya Saxena brought us uh, a requel to the 1973 snake-based ba horror movie. Yes. So now we're keeping the animal theme going. Yes, although. Right. This movie really. has little to do with the actual black yeah, cat this, in the this title. This movie could have been called Bad Vibes House, and I think <laughs> that would have been more accurate. Um, but yeah, I know this is a movie that my friend Will Meneker described as uh, two sparthy foreigners uh, facing off for the right to touch the hair of an American woman. <laughs> yeah, that's that's essentially it. The first of eight movies that Lugosi and Karloff made together. Um, because this is just after the success of Dracula and Frankenstein. And so I'm sure, you know, Universal was pretty excited to get them together. Highest box office film for Universal in 1934. So sort of in a way, very much in line with our crossover mentality right. that we have here. Now they're playing both against type a little bit, mm -hmm. interestingly enough. We have we have Bela Lugosi as the as the like sort of shifty but ultimately benevolent 
the the rare benevolent foreigner in a mm-hmm. uh, uh, universal in film. A, in a film, not in general. In a, in a, univer- <laughs> in a universal put film. A full stop. Don't yes. clip that out and no. put that, uh, <laughs> use that against Dylan. And, uh, we- and then uh, and then Karloff as the the sort of sick, horny bastard. Although yeah. we, we do get Karloff doing like that very slow sit up in bed when he's yes. first introduced. Mm-hmm. He does go Undertaker. I know mode. there were people in the theater who were just pointing at the screen. Like, yeah, That's, he's doing it. It was the Captain America grabbing right. Mjolnir moment. Yep. Everyone cheering. Mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. but that brings us to like I guess one of the first things to talk about in this movie is the atmosphere is like so much of it that yeah. it is it is eerie and spooky and expressionistic in a way that I that as I understand it was sort of groundbreaking for American studio films. I find this to be the scariest of the universal classic horror films that I've seen. Like, I think it actually very successfully invokes a lot of like dread. Yeah. Um, more so than like, I feel like the other ones, like you can, you can see that they would be scary for their time. Uh, and they're phenomenal movies. Obviously we love them here, but like, I'm not watching the Lugosi Dracula and like actually right. feeling afraid of him. Yeah. You're not afraid. I mean, like, you know, Black Lagoon is great, but you're not mm-hmm. like afraid of the monster so much. There are some beautifully shot scenes, mm-hmm. but this is a movie where there are no monsters except for man. Yes. Uh, and uh, and war. And also war and trauma and Satanism. Mm-hmm. And it is so much about the vibes. It's it's an early example of psychological horror, which I, is one reason why I think it's so interesting. Mm-hmm. And yeah, 1934. Um, so very like, you know, it seems a lot like a modern horror movie to me in a yeah. lot of ways. Absolutely. The only thing that, I mean, uh, the one thing that I didn't like about the movie, and we'll go through the plot and stuff soon, but while we're talking about the atmosphere, I feel like the score actually runs very counter. Like, the the score is not an original score. No. It is mostly a collection <laughs> of, like, early romantic pieces. Yes. It's a lot of like Tchaikovsky and uh, who else? Like Chopin. There's like yeah. that bridal theme. I feel like yeah. that recurs throughout it's, the movie. It's the main theme from Romeo and Juliet. Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet, which right. plays when one of the when uh, Joan like passes out and is being kidnapped mm-hmm. by like Lugosi's servant, and it's playing the love theme from Romeo and Juliet. And I know that like musical modernism hadn't been invented yet at this time, but like. We, it was the 1930s. We're like past the late romantic period. Sure, there could have been some is, more dissonance. It's sort of an experiment, think, though, because this was one of the first talkies to have a almost continuous score. Like, if you mm-hmm. go back and watch the original 31 Dracula, it's weird how quiet it is mm-hmm. that this mm-hmm. it just wasn't convention yet to yeah. do to, to create an atmospheric score in a movie that had its own recorded sound. So it's... You and know, so like it's the a horror step. score hadn't been really sure, you right, know, codified yeah. yet. What was making me crazy while I was listening to it is that I kept thinking that it was like a version of the Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet theme that was had like the serial numbers filed off. Like some, some of the intervals <laughs> right, were slightly yeah. different. Mm-hmm. Like they were trying to get away with something. And yeah. I'm, like, so I'm like, okay, well, was Tchaikovsky still under copyright in 1934? <laughs> and they were like, we're getting, we're pulling one over. I don't think they one changed over. it enough. But yeah, it really has that weird thing where it's like, if you were, if you were watching like a, a new spooky horror movie and like, illumination style a bunch of like familiar pop hits started playing underneath it (laughs) for the entire film if yeah if it like some of the scenes like in the in the basement and stuff if they were if it was just like a little bit more dissonance in the score it would be like twice as chilling you know Mm -hmm. but like it feels like and and then we also get though at one point karloff plays the organ Uh and plays box toccata and fugue yeah the classic like which now I, I had once he did that, I had to look up the history of that in film because yeah. it's such a cliche now. Apparently, uh-huh. yeah. this is the second time it was ever used in a sound oh, wow. film. But in the silent era, it was like a cliche already. Mm, okay. So in the okay. silent era, that was like a classic thing for horror and villainy as you'd play Box Toccata and Fugue. Um, but the first film to use it was the 1931 Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the Paramount version, uh-huh. which used it. And then this movie with Karloff playing it on the organ. And it's just... So weird to see that, like, played straight. (laughs) Right. Yeah, like, one of the first examples of this actually being done. Yeah. It's impossible to see that scene today and not take it as a joke. Think of, like, a hundred Looney Tunes, you know. Well, exactly. Between the Tchaikovsky and that, there definitely, I was thinking about Bugs Bunny a lot. Yes. A lot more than I wanted to be thinking about Bugs Bunny during (laughs) this movie, which is, like, it's heavy. Like, thematically, it's heavy. Fucked up shit happens. 
Uh, and so let's let's get into some of the yeah, fucked up shit yeah. that happens. Um, well, let's. I mean, let's start with the title card, which says <laughs> "Suggested <laughs> by suggested. Edgar Allan Poe." Mm-hmm. Very lightly there is, suggested. There is a Poe story called "The Black Cat." Mm-hmm. This movie has essentially nothing to do with it. So yeah. this is sort of a one of the first examples I think of that kind of based on a true story kind of thing, except it's an adaptation, but not really at all. Yeah, it's it, like oh, people know who Poe is. They'll come see a movie that has that in the the press. I think that's kind of yeah, because like people also know Dracula and Frankenstein. Right. I guess you want like the IP in that <laughs> yeah. you want the recognizable IP. I guess to draw people in. But yeah, nothing well, in common we, with. We the can't Poe really story. criticize for that, considering how many times we've like advertised an episode of like oh yeah, we're doing a remake of X or Y, and it turns out to have nothing to do with okay. the movie <laughs> that we're you're taking it on. a shot at my Bride of Frankenstein. That's fine, no. you know. <laughs> Dalton, your Bride of Frankenstein is fantastic. <laughs> people love it. We people are loving it. People we did tri- not. The Pretorius Hive did not have my head. For <laughs> yes, it. but it has like nothing to do with the James Whale movie. Well, so. <laughs> um, it has as much in common with the Poe story as like the Fast and Furious movies have to do with Roger Corman's Fast and Furious movie, <laughs> uh, which is Universal just bought the title off of him and was like, right. hey, can we use this? Uh, which is great because otherwise those movies would be called Race Wars. Um, and maybe one does, does everyone know this? That that was the working title of the Fast and Furious? It was going to be called Race, Race Wars. Wars. Uh, we invented it. <laughs> uh, well, the Japanese title is Wild Speed, and that fucking rocks. So movies good. are still that's called Wild good. Speed, yeah. like Wild Speed Sky Mission, mm-hmm, Wild Speed mm-hmm. Euro Mission, but uh, <laughs> Race Wars. Race Wars. Maybe wouldn't have gotten to ten plus installments. Might not have. There is some exciting car action in this movie too, though. That's there true. Is. There's an, um, as, I mean, we start on a train, mm-hmm. and then we do go to a car. But do we want to just? Start from the top or just run through really quick or what? Yeah, let's let's talk about where we begin the story. It is it is contemporary set, but has a lot to do with World War One. Mm-hmm. So basically, we have these this American couple who are on their honeymoon in Hungary. And they are they have their their train compartment and there is a mix up and they have to share it with the immediately really creepy Bela Lugosi just mm-hmm. kind of doing his thing. And uh, om- the, one of the very first things he does is just kind of stare at the woman of the couple. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember their names. <laughs> They're not really important to uh, the story. Joan, Joan. I think uh, she's great, by the way. The yes. actress, she's mm-hmm. given like nothing to do. Yes, uh, yeah. And she is like, she's really good in this movie. Um, and then the uh, the guy, I don't remember his name i've written down mr somewhere, but, allison uh david yes. manners is the actor who was also in the mummy and uh dracula he was right. uh yeah. he was jonathan harker but um, we're going to be doing a lot of referring to characters by their actors names in this episode i right. did not write down Karloff or lugosi's character names because first of all they're uh hard, hard to, to remember say. yeah dr yes. vendor goss I, is maybe Lugosi, but they're Lugosi and Karloff. Yes, yeah, yeah. The like movie. they're just doing themselves. It's sort yeah. of in this movie. Um, I do want to point out they are traveling to the town of Gurmbush. Gurmbush, Gr- yeah. Gurmbush, which I don't think is real. I've is looked it? up a lot of locations. I've seen this movie twice now. Okay. And I've looked up a lot of locations from it, and I can't tell if they're not real or if they were such small towns that they just no longer exist. Right, they might have and been never renamed. had an internet footprint. Um, but it's unclear a lot of the locations. I love the word Groombush. And if we can confirm it's not real, we should use it as a fictional location. Unless it's going to be in your remake. Maybe Groombush is in your remake. Oh, it's, it's, I can assure you it is not. <laughs> might be a good location for Dark Legion 2. Maybe would they all go to Groombush. All right, yeah. So we have to do Groombush and we have to go to the Snake Town. Yes, from those Snake are the Town two. From the, S- yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. The two prime locations of Dark Legion 2. Spoiler alert for that movie <laughs> coming up. All right, so they're on their way to their honeymoon. They're actually... Quite physically affectionate for, I guess this is this, this is pre code, right? Uh, yeah. Yes. So it's I was surprised that like, oh, you know what? This these these two newlyweds are are permitted to get like pretty frisky with one another on. They screen. ask each other if they're hungry in a very mm. suggestive manner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was as horny as you could get in yeah. 1934. <laughs> yeah. Would you like some lunch? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but they basically split a cab with Bell Lugosi, and they are in a terrible accident that claims the life of their driver. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And. You know, while they're en route, they sort of learn some of his backstory that he was in this horrible, like, military prison for, I think, like, 15 years. He fought in World War One, was captured, and uh, it almost immediately just makes a bad impression on everyone because <laughs> he's just staring at 
the woman and being like, she reminds me of my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and like Peter Allison, I think his name is Peter. So right, like, right. Yeah. Ah, mm, mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, she's my wife, so <laughs> she also reminds me of my wife because that's who <laughs> yeah. she is. So don't forget that. So they make their way to the home of Lugosi's old friend, uh, Boris Karloff. And he has this completely deranged mansion that is built on the site of the, is it the... Uh, fortress yeah, that so used to exist? I think the lore here is that this was a, yeah, like a, a fortress in World War One that Karloff was in charge of, basically. Yes. And he, like, sold them out to the bad guys. And everyone was, like, killed or taken prisoner and, like, tortured for, like, 15 years, Lugosi being one of them. And now Lugosi has basically come back at, for, like, revenge. Yes. He's like, you, you know, like, I haven't, seen I was taken away from my wife and my daughter I was tortured the lucky ones died you know and Karloff has come back and built he's now like the uh, one of the most famous architects in the world and mm-hmm. has built like a super modern uh mansion on top of this prison camp basically um which I think ends up being very thematically important for the film uh, later but uh, yeah, so that's sort of like, it, at, at, for the first like half, no, I don't want to say half hour, it's only an hour movie, but like 20 minutes, it's like basically like a wartime revenge thriller. Mm-hmm. It's kind of Hitchcockian mm-hmm. for like, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, f- for the beginning at least. Right, right, and yeah. And briefly, during all of this information, we meet a cat. Mm-hmm. There is a black cat. <laughs> and that's all we'll have to say about that. Uh, there a black, <laughs> so we have this conversation, you know, Lugosi confronts Karloff and says he knows that he's the reason why he spent all this time in prison. And he knows, I think, that he did something with his wife or married his wife or something and um, wants revenge. A cat interrupts the scene, and Lugosi picks up a knife off Mm -hmm. a table and throws it at the cat and kills it. Question mark. Someone does say later on that he killed a cat. We do see a cat again later on. It may be the same one. It may not be. It Yeah, it happens off screen. Because, yes. like, he throws it and you don't see what happened. And he doesn't, like, he doesn't throw it like John Locke in Lost. He just kind of tosses a knife at yes. it. And it's it was surprising to me to learn that that would have dealt a well, killing blow. Well, you hear someone kind of offhandedly say, I forget who it is, but just say, oh, he killed that cat earlier. No one seems upset at all by the fact that this man has just murdered a cat. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very, very strange. The idea is uh, Lugosi is terrified of cats, yes, basically, yeah. is what we find. And there's some lore given about sort of the role of black cats and uh, how they are symbolic of death, but they are deathless. Um, mm-hmm. And that's where like the thing of cats having nine lives come from. And they sort of wax poetic about the black cat for right. a little bit. And we can try and draw thematic lines from that, but it also kind of reads as if it's included that we can call this movie yes, the black cat. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it feels like his fear of cats is never really central to the plot. Um, it's yeah. You kind of imagine just, it would come back in the climax, right. maybe be his undoing. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, doesn't happen. I have, I have some thematic reads of it that we can get to when we get through the plot summary that are maybe big reaches, but, uh, Okay. I, I have I have some thoughts, but it's not as consequential as you would think right. given the title of the film. But so yeah, we get this also we get this thing where um where Joan is kind of like sleepwalking or hypnotized or something because uh she's been given this narcotic to help her sleep and she's just acting really strange. And um almost immediately, like to their credit and like to the credit of this movie the protagonists are pretty intelligent mm-hmm. and they're like, this house has terrible vibes. <laughs> we need to leave immediately. Mm-hmm. And um, they start, you know, trying to get out. And well, before that, I, I want to touch on this narcotic okay, because yes, yeah. this is the first of many insane escalations yes. in the movie because like you said, she comes out and she's acting very strangely. And when they ask Lugosi for an explanation, he says that the narcotic might give her medium, like the, yes, the abilities yeah. of a medium, that she is channeling the forces around her that I guess like taking a sedative has made her psychic somehow. Mm-hmm. And she is now challenging or Listen, channeling all the bad energy. It's the 30s. Like, psychology is sort of just mood based, <laughs> yeah. vibes based. We're sort of riffing and just figuring things out. So, yeah. Uh, 
And that also doesn't come back. I was really no. expecting yep. that to be like, okay, yep. that's going to be, so she's going to be channeling all the spirits of mm-hmm. the dead soldiers here. No, after that scene, it is dropped. A lot of threads get dropped in this movie. Yeah, <laughs> which is what's making me excited to hear what you have in your version, because there's so much meat left on the bone of this thing. There's so many ideas that could be expanded. You mm. could pick any of the various dangling threads and make a whole movie out Absolutely. of just like that one thing. So Joan is sleepwalking. She was injured in the crash, uh, but she's recovering. And so while she's sort of like incapacitated, there's now like sort of, uh, uh, a strange sort of tug of war happening over her future. Karloff has decided that he wants to add her to his collection of dead question mark women Involved in glass women. Yes, yes. Uh, in uh, glass cases. Uh, that he Nora keeps Freeze down in the style. basement, like where the original you know parts of the prison camp are, like or with like torture the equipment and, stuff. and like, yeah, yeah. And uh, Bela Lugosi's character is trying to sort of combat him about this and say you can't do this and then agrees to play chess for her life Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you have dracula and frankenstein sitting down for a friendly game of chess the stakes are uh, of which as previously mentioned who gets to touch the american woman's hair honestly (laughs) i i don't hate the premise no yeah (laughs) (laughs) because they do like fight later on but i like the the uh the idea of the battle of minds right uh, with someone's life in the balance and that was what the part of it that i imagined that the the short story included. I thought that that was perhaps what the the story was that the rest of this was built around, and that apparently that's not true at all. No, yeah. <laughs> the story is <laughs> that would make sense, but yeah, I think the story is basically just the telltale heart with a dead cat. And I think there's a little of, bit of okay. a casket of uh, casket of cat. Cask of Amontillado. Thank Amontillado, you. Yeah. Uh, in there as well, there's like somebody hidden behind a wall. So you have this sort of battle of wills, and the husband comes to like talk to them a couple times. And he has like, hey, I'm trying to get in touch with the authorities, trying to book a car. And they're like, leave us alone. We're trying to play chess here. (laughs) Also, crazy comic relief all of a sudden from the cops. Oh, yes. Oh, my God. When the cops show up halfway through and they're so delighted to see Americans because it's the 30s. And And they're like fighting over whose town is the nicest. Right. My small backwater Hungarian town is the most beautiful of all. And then they just leave. Yeah, yep. it's the one sort of bright spot of levity in the whole movie, mm-hmm. and it is so isolated. Yeah. Uh, like, it's not like you have the you have like the sort of like the groundskeeper characters in Dracula who pop in in and out. This is just well, we're halfway through the movie, right? We gotta, we well, gotta there, pick things up a little bit. There's one more moment at the very end, but we'll get to that. Yes, yeah, yeah. But uh, so yeah, you know, so Lugosi like goes to kill him and you know follows him down in the basement and sees all of the preserved women and like sees that his his wife is there. And um, then it turns out also that Lugosi's daughter is still alive and um, is in the house and is like being kept in her like secret bedroom while uh, Frankenstein is reading satanic books. (laughs) Yeah, let's, should we dwell on the wife and daughter or get to the Satanism of it all? Like uh, which, which path should we go down right now? Well, I guess we'll just clarify for the audience. We have... Embalmed women stood up like dolls in glass cases downstairs, mm-hmm. one of whom is Bella Lugosi's dead wife. Honestly, though, very striking images. Like, oh, you yes, can't absolutely. really see how yeah. they're suspended. They're like, is it by the hair? They're in like, like her big hair is glass spread cases. Out? It's very, yeah. It, yeah. Is, it is very eerie and surreal and really cool. And uh, Carlos. And even the introduction of, of Carlos' character, and we then only see in silhouette, the daughter mm-hmm. is. For one thing, striking in that they're in bed together and it's the 1930s, which I don't, you know, again, pre-code. Uh, yeah, but, it was a very suggestive image. Yeah, and like there's this weird sort of, uh, there's this air that he's got her under some kind of spell. He's like, you're not to leave this space. And she's and he, she's aware that this is the guy who knew her dad, but she doesn't know that her dad's alive. So he's lied, he's lied to her that her father is dead. She's led, uh, apparently lied to others, to imply that she is dead so no one comes looking for her. Well, and he so he tells Lugosi, he was like, oh yeah, your wife and daughter died after you were in the prison camp uh, of like natural cause or whatever. They just, sorry, you know, here I have your wife's body because she's so beautiful. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, normal. normal. But like, trust me, she just died normal. And Lugosi is like, no, you killed her. And there's never any real evidence either way. Uh, but Karloff is lying because the daughter is alive and he has married her, mm-hmm. it seems. Um, and then Lugosi goes to shoot Karloff and is interrupted by the black cat. Right. I don't know what... Maybe I just missed this. 
Does he lose the gun? Because at that no point after that does he try to shoot Karloff again. Well, there's just the one gun, right? It's the husband's gun. Okay, because and it gets passed around throughout the film. Yeah, right. He okay. took the gun from that's and he the husband later on is like my my pistol's missing. Oh yeah, that's right. Um, that's right. Because I he's think, an American traveling in Europe, so naturally he's got a gun in his suitcase. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think. I think. Yeah, basically, um, just Karloff says like no let's settle this like gentlemen or like yeah. intellectuals or whatever um i'm doing why am i doing a lugosi voice <laughs> i'm just talking to carl <laughs> um but so he kind of i guess just agrees to that weirdly because maybe he's just like it'll be satisfying to defeat this man it was a very me, confident chess player mm. it reminded me of like in a wrestling match when someone like goes for a big move with a sledgehammer and misses it and then drops the sledgehammer and forgets about it <laughs> right. it's like oh well, well i gave it a shot and now uh that's just gonna disappear yep. under the ring mm-hmm. uh because time to move on to something else uh just no object permanence like darn and- the shooting plan didn't work right lugosi was going to shoot karloff while the ref's back was turned and then the ref turns back around he has to right. throw the gun mm-hmm. uh exactly so karloff wins the chess match, uh, which means that Lugosi basically at least has to appear to abide by the rules of their Mm -hmm. agreement and stand idly by while he conducts his plan to abduct and brainwash this woman. And that night, it's the dark of the moon, which is... The third Transformers film. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Which is apparently some satanic ritual that Karloff is going to partake in with his satanic sect, which we have just learned exists. Mm -hmm. And if we have any Satanists listening who want to clarify if any of this is real or they just made it up, uh, please uh, hit us up on Twitter or Instagram at Dark Universe Pod or on our Discord. Uh, So they're getting ready for Dark of the Moon. Uh, Meanwhile, uh, Joan's husband is coming down and like, hey, we got to go. Uh, we're going to call a car. Can you drive us? And nothing works. Karloff keeps them there. At, a, at one point, they do try to leave, and Lugosi's assistant knocks them out. Right, they try to just leave on foot. Like, they're yeah. really determined. Like, they're like, oh, we'll call the police. They come by, and they're like, there's nothing we can do. They try to, like, take the car. They tr- mm-hmm. And eventually, they're just like, we're just going to walk out of here. And then at that point, they have to, like, drop the pretense and just, like, knock him out and lock him up. Which yeah, is, and, and to your earlier point, they're never fooled into thinking that like, oh, well, it's a weird coincidence that we can't get out of here. It's like right. very obvious, like, oh, <laughs> yeah. we've been kidnapped. Right. I do think it actually also does a good job of building that tension of like, there's no way out of here. Of yeah. The cops come, but like, they're like, well, we came on bikes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we rode our bicycles. We can't we're really like, give you a ride. We're goofy little mountain rural police. We wear jaunty hats and capes. So. <laughs> yeah. And the phone's out and, you know, they're like, the car is not working. And like, the husband is getting increasingly desperate. And it is like... You can see like him realizing like something fucked up is going on here and I need to get out of here. And mm-hmm. it, it's it's uh, it's claustrophobic. And so now Lugosi is trying to basically see how well he can help Joan without being caught and try to prevent this ritual from happening. Mm-hmm. Right. And then the ritual happens. Then the ritual happens. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And there's a satanic ritual in the basement. Peter gets thrown into this really interesting dungeon that has like this revolving, it's sort of like a turnstile. Which is really cool because the camera is in the cell with him. And I get the impression at least that the cell is what's rotating. Yeah. But because the camera is inside it, it looks like the outside hallway is spinning around. It's just a a very cool kind of disorienting effect. There's um, a lot of cool production flares like that. There's, There's nothing... Apart from the fact that they're in like, oh, it's like a big spooky house on the hill, everything about the house feels specific and original and weird. It's very cool. There's the really cool shots of, there's like these close-up shots of Karloff and Lugosi when they're looking at the women's bodies that are embalmed that are very uh, striking sort of framings and it all looks really cool. And all that gets cranked up to 11 when the ritual starts because that's where it really feels like our perspective as a viewer becomes kind of unhinged. Mm-hmm. And that's like exciting and certainly, I think, a, a, a leap beyond what we'd seen in the earlier 30s Universal pictures. Well, and then the violence gets ramped up as well. Right. Um, who wants to talk about wow, yeah. the showdown? God, yeah. I mean, Lugosi and Karloff are struggling and it looks kind of like Karloff maybe has the upper hand. And then Lugosi's guy shows up mm-hmm. and helps him wrestle him into submission and uh, he attaches or, or mounts him to his skinning rack or his embalming rack, yeah, I guess. He yeah, like some sort of torture rack. Right, yeah. and uh, starts flaying him alive. Yeah, so the the climactic moment of the movie is Lugosi flaying 
Karloff with a knife. Um, and and we, it happens in silhouette. You yeah, obviously, we, we don't you know, get to you know, see it directly, see it. but the silhouette is very effective in being yes, like a, yeah. creating the fucked up visual in your mind. And you hear him like screaming in the background and like it's uh, it goes full martyrs mode. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and this is how they spend their final moments because what we have not mentioned is that the entire facility is wired to explode. There is <laughs> right. a- The movie hasn't mentioned that either, to be fair. <laughs> right. Uh, that is also There's no mentioned foreshadowing at the last this, Other than the fact that it was built on this fortress. And there is a lever there's yes, just right. a, there's a big lever. lever big they can say, okay, the six, we have 65 minutes. We're at minute 60. Here's the bomb. <laughs> We're going to pull a thing. We have literally just, it's timed for, we don't know how long the fuse ex- is, except for that it's going to be, we presume, exactly long enough for our breeding couple to get out of the uh, really, of the house. Just another Looney Tunes moment. Yes. Like you're seeing how much Looney Tunes was influenced by this film. Right. But so there is this kind of like tragic, semi kind of tragic climax to this movie because you know, Peter has just escaped from the prison that he's been mm-hmm. stuck in and uh, fights his way to the scene where this is happening. And he sees Lugosi helping Joan with something. They're trying, They're to, trying to get, to the get gun. a key or oh, the a key, gun, the key, a key yeah. to like open the door so that she can get out. And uh, from his perspective, it looks like he's attacking her. Mm-hmm. And so he uh, fatally shoots Lugosi and is who's just like, oh, he fucking... Jack. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to help. Uh, and Joan is like, he was only trying to help. He was only trying to help. And so at this point, Lugosi decides like, all right, let's just wipe the slate clean. The sins of this place need to be like scoured from the earth. And we are going to, I'm going to blow up not only myself, not only Karloff, but like his entire cult mm-hmm. who presumably die in this explosion. We don't really see them once they leave. Yeah, I assume yeah. they're still puttering around somewhere. We don't get uh, much detail about the what the ritual is for. Um, other than it seems as if it's going to in some way sacrifice Joan, whether right. it's bodily or psychologically. There's also a bit where Joan meets the daughter mm-hmm. who I guess right. wanders out of her uh, secluded bedroom and Joan tells her the truth. That after her dad's which, alive. Yeah, that her dad's alive, after which Karlov immediately murders her. Yeah. Yes, right. You hear it happen like from the other room. High body count. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it is kind of shocking. And there's the idea, I guess, I mean, not, not that we haven't gleaned that uh, he finds these women to be disposable and then displayable, uh, <laughs> but uh, I guess the idea is, well, I've got Joan now, and we'll just right. slaughter right in. Model, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it ends with a ends with a big bang, mm-hmm. and as as many films should, uh, I will be disappointed if your remake does not end with a giant house blowing up. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to say that if it's not in your pitch. And you, and you want that green light, get a, that scribble down. it right back in there. We're going to uh, blow up the house at the end, no matter what. All right. Yeah. <laughs> they get away. Yes. And then they're on the train and um, reading, because we haven't mentioned this at all, actually, but Peter is a novelist, a mystery novelist. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're reading a review of his latest book. And the review says something like, oh, it's well written, but it's too outlandish. We wish he would stick to the realm of the believable. Yeah, and they just strains each, credulity. They look at each other and are just like, <laughs> countless people just died. <laughs> <laughs> and like that's the end of the movie. They laugh it off because they're Americans and they'll never die. And they're young <laughs> and beautiful. Mm-hmm. And the horrors of this war-torn continent cannot possibly touch their hearts. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it is a bizarre <laughs> Another eight years. <laughs> they really seem completely undisturbed by what just happened. Like, right. they, like there's even this moment where you think, but like, oh, was this whole thing the book? Right. Is, are they trying to pull a, this was all a dream type thing? Mm, okay. Slash this was, it was, oh, this is just what happens in his novel. I have a lot of thoughts about this end scene. Okay. Uh, can I get into, I'm going to get on my analytical high horse for Please. a second. Um, which I'm not a, a film analyst or anything. So whenever I talk about stuff like this, I don't know if I'm being really obvious or reaching way the fuck out there. But up until that last scene, I was ready to kind of write off this movie as like, oh, this is a lot of fun. It's crazy, like just weird excess. What a kind of, uh, it's a great movie, but like a weird little footnote in, you know, sort of film history that's sort of undone by the zaniness of the plot. I think that final scene kind of actually ties a lot of things together. And I think on the one hand, I think partially what that final scene does is it's sort of a 
happy ending for the audience in the 30s where mm. it's a very dark ending. And I think I think it's kind of a self-winking thing where it's like, I don't think we're literally supposed to think the events were his novel, but I think when they talk about straining credulity, it is self-referential. It is referencing the movie. It's saying, wow, a lot of crazy stuff just happened, right? I think it's sort of like talking to the audience like, uh, hey, that was a wild trip, wasn't it? Now we can laugh about it because it wasn't real. Um, you don't have to, you know be up at night worrying about flayings. Mm -hmm. Um, This is, this was all in good fun. But more than that, I think it sort of thematically ties the movie together. I I think the sort of insane escalation of the plot is actually intentional. I think what the movie is about is sort of papering over the real life horrors of the past with modernity, with like excessive Mm -hmm. modernity. Mm -hmm. And in the plot, this is shown with Karloff returning to the site of the prison camp and literally building like a hyper modern mansion on top of it. Right. The, as I, as we talked about the sort of the beginning of the movie is very grounded in world war one. And this movie came out, you know, like, Shortly afterwards, just pre-World War II, like, this was a very, these were current things it was talking about. It was talking about a lot of the real horrors of war, like these prison camps where people were tortured, people were lucky if they died. I was there for 15 years. I lost my family. Like, I I kind of, for the beginning of the movie, I was kind of thinking a lot of His House, which we've talked about on this Mm -hmm. show before, which is a very effective uh, horror movie, partially because it's set against the backdrop of the Sudanese refugee crisis. And like, for all the supernatural stuff that happens, it's scarier because these people have just lived through real life atrocities, right? And that's kind of where I thought the beginning of the movie was going, was it was going to be all about sort of the ghosts of World War I haunting this house. And then things quickly kind of get off the rails. Um, and I think it's sort of doing the same thing. The idea of Karloff coming back and to the site of his crime, right? He sold out this prison camp and sentenced, I think he says, like thousands of people to their deaths. Um, and then building this mansion on top of it, I think also is is sort of about how this movie returns to the horrors of World War I, um, but is about sort of Hollywood can only visit these horrors by dressing it up in sort mm. of the conventions of Hollywood or pulp, uh, whether, you know, like the mystery novel that the main character is writing. Um, but it, it's sort of our obsession with returning to the most unbearable horrors of our world and making it palatable through media. Mm. Um, and so while it starts as like, the story of these World War I torture people. And it's like, but also it's Satanism. And also what if this narcotic made you psychic? And also there are like bodies embalmed. And also <laughs> there's going to be flaying. And also like, it's just sort of like dressing all these uh, things that were at the time, pulp conventions and horror conventions until the point where like all that World War I stuff is completely forgotten. It's buried under mm. the excess of the film's plot machinations, much in the way the bodies are literally buried under Karloff's mansion. That is my read of the film, is that it is sort of about how we digest real-life horror, Uh, which brings me to The Black Cat, um, which I sort of read in that context as like, Lugosi is terrified of the black cat. Every time it comes up, whatever he's doing, he stops and freaks the fuck out. Mm -hmm. Which I think my stretch of a read here is that the black cat represents the sort of real horror that threads through the film. It is sort of a reminder of real death. uh, As they say, you know, black cats are deathless, deathless like evil. The sort of, uh, the nagging sort of feeling you get through movies like this, where even though you are having a good time, it is actually pulling at your fears of mortality and Mm. uh, fears of the real shit that it's talking about, you know? And it's that sort of um, interruption of the narrative uh, for the sake of terror. I don't know. That's I mean, listen, that's, I like the movie more now. Yeah. (laughs) It's like really interesting take. That that might be a reach, or I, I don't know if it's, uh, you know, Film Theory 101, but that was sort of like my uh, reading of that ending scene. I think that ending scene is kind of like, you know, saying, yeah, things got ridiculous there, but it, it didn't start there. You no, know? I, I like that, though, because I think there's, there's sort of the dangerous tendency that we can have to look at sort of old, like, B-movies, and this is like 65 minutes, like, like yeah. definitely feels like, you know, like we said, it was sort of an attempt to cash in on the 
the name Edgar Allan Poe and the star power of Lugosi and Karloff. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that people did not pour their thoughts and their fears and put like real artistic work into this script, right? I know that yeah. early Hollywood, they're churning these out like crazy, but they, these, these are storytellers. These are writers. They're, 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 right. We shouldn't dismiss the possibility of this type of really deep read being the intent of the story. The, just the fact that so much of the opening is about this prison camp, and then by the end, it's throwing ideas at you like a mile a minute, and then it comments on it at the end, just made me go, I think this was all very intentional, so what was the intent, you know? And I think that there might also be a degree to which, as we were talking about, there is so much going on here, and it's it's so short. And it really makes me wonder if it has to have that sort of short story quality where everything has to be doing five things because you do mm. not have the space to put any irrelevant information in. And so right. it is our job as the viewer to do that work because we have we have some really stunning and interesting visuals to work with. We have some interesting thematic material, but the plot is so jagged and, uh, and like you said, it has these huge stairs of escalation because it, maybe because it has to. Yeah. Because in order to get all these ideas in there, the screen storytellers had to rip out all the fat and say, okay, here's the movie. Which is actually impressive for the time because a lot of these universal horror movies do not move like this. Like we've talked about Dracula gets slow yeah. in its mm. second act, like really slow. And this movie, compared to a lot of these classic uh, universal horror movies, keeps moving right along. Like you could say like the chess stuff kind of slows things down in the middle, um, but it accelerates pretty constantly through the movie, I think. Yeah. And also for all intents and purposes, this is an original screenplay, right? Yeah. We've talked about right. how it yeah. doesn't really have anything to do with the post story. So <laughs> except for the presence of a black cat, everything here <laughs> is about the intent of this screenwriter who we should, uh, frankly, uh, know the name of. <laughs> I would like to know a lot more about the director and the writer of this and see, uh, I know the director is from, I think, the Czech Republic. Um, and, you know, uh, how much of this is based on their own wartime experiences, you know? Mm. It's also interesting that this is not, like, this will pop in and out of Universal Horror Collections, like the big right. DVD box set. Yeah. I think it was included when they put all of the horror classics up on Peacock last October. They'll probably mm. do it again this year. But this is not one of the better known ones. It's not, like, part of, like, the hard canon of Universal Horror movies. There's a whole string of Poe adaptations they did that sort of don't get the same recognition. I think, you know, part of it is the no recognizable, like, monster icon. Cons, but, mm. yeah, but um, the drag about that is that we don't have all of these like mini docs about the yeah. like there's so much about like Kurt Siodmak coming up with the Wolfman on those Blu-ray sets mm -hmm. right and you get to learn about his history and his life and like how he basically came up with this entire genre of conventions all at once we don't have that for this mm -hmm. maybe we need to do some more research and uh, it'll be good fodder for the bonus pod eventually when, <laughs> when that happens we can dive into the life of the director of the black cat <laughs> Uh, how, does that make you want to spend your five bucks on our Patreon? <laughs> yes, uh, please go to patreon.com slash Dylan and Dalton. If you and want to hear a deep dive on the director of The Black Cat. Edgar G. Ulmer. Yeah, join our Dark Legion. But, uh, but we are we have a here, new yeah. version of The Black mm -hmm. Cat that Mary, we need to hear. Do you have anything you want to add about the classic Black Cat before we take no, our break? No, I feel like we covered it. Yeah, let's get into it. All right, we'll be right back with Merritt's new take on The Black Cat right after this. Hey there, I'm David. I'm Tess. I'm Giovanni. And I'm Greg. And we're Left Trigger, Right Trigger, your video game book club. Each episode, we pick a topic, and each of us brings a video game that we think best fits that topic. Tune into the show to find out how Super Mario Land is all about travel. Or how Bloodborne is a game about sacrifice. Or how SimCity is actually a conspiracy to mine data about human infrastructure. No, we Greg, have to stop. We're doing a pro it's a promo. Please stop. Please stop. Intrigued? A little scared? Us too. Make sure to catch us every other Tuesday on your favorite Podcatcher app. See you there. Welcome back to the Dark Universe. We are here with Merritt Kay, and we're about to hear her pitch for a remake of The Black Cat. And uh, we know nothing about it other than it's called, well, actually, we don't even know that it's called The Black Cat. Merritt? Yeah, I'm not 100% sure that it's called The Black Cat. It might have a 
uh, a title card that says suggested by the black hat. <laughs> I, it would be really funny if you came in and had a pitch that in the spirit of this movie was nothing, had nothing to do with the original movie. Yeah, it's not called the black hat. It has nothing to do with it. It's just an original pitch, uh, much so, like that movie was. I mean, I was thinking about it and I was thinking, okay, what are the elements we want to keep from this beloved 1934 yes. classic. It's Absolutely. passed down through generations. Parents show it to their children. Um, <laughs> this thematically rich. It's thematically film. rich text. Yes. We want to keep the psychological horror, obviously, mm-hmm. a big part of it. We want to keep a big, huge, weird house. To me, that is a really big part. The sets Absolutely. in this movie are fantastic. We want to keep that. We want to keep a psychic struggle between two leads with uh, an unwitting couple caught in the middle. I love this. And we want to keep some kind of cults or like dark influence. And in terms of things I think we can lose, uh-huh. I think the black cat doesn't need to be in there. <laughs> okay, fair. <laughs> to be honest, but- I don't think the black cat needs... We can maybe talk about working it in, but I know it's called the black cat. But then you're going to keep people wondering, when's that black cat going to show up? If it doesn't end up being called the black cat, mm-hmm. I kind of like that because it would give us an opportunity to sort of make two black cat movies in our dark universe. Like if yours is based on the plot of the black cat movie, mm. but without the black cat... We could still be open to make a movie in our in our main line called The Black Cat that is maybe more based on the Poe story or on the 1941 remake, which mm. I haven't seen. I don't know if it's any good. Um, or just an original film about a black cat. We could, you know, just saying it, it'll, it might leave some doors open. All right. So All right. let's open the door to this particular story. Yeah. Yes. How do we kick in? We begin on a flight uh, from South Korea. Okay. To the United States. And this is in the modern day? This is in the current day. Okay. Okay. A newlywed couple, uh, Kang Yongwoo and Kang Min Jun, are heading to Southern California for their honeymoon. Okay. They transfer in Atlanta and are seated next to an American named Peter Stone, who is a psychiatrist traveling to meet an old friend. He, it turns out, was working at a healthcare firm in the 2000s, but was arrested for fraud and spent the last 15 years in jail, despite protesting his innocence. Okay. The three share a small plane to their destination when they arrive in California, but it is it crashes, the pilot is killed, and uh, Min Jun is injured. But uh, Peter suggests that they travel to the home of his old friend, James Foster, who has built an enormous, strange house in a remote location in the desert. Okay. Uh, James turns out to be a wealthy entrepreneur who has made his fortune in software. As it transpires, they Peter and James were once colleagues, and Peter was framed by James for the fraud that James, in fact, they perpetuated. In gotcha. While Peter was in jail, James stole his wife and daughter, and we kind of go from there with some changes, obviously. I like the the the, the setup is is very a, a modernization of the original story. It's a modernization of the original, and I wanted to flip it because in the original, it's Americans going to Europe, and we're getting sort of a, it's sort of a, again we were talking about this. You were talking about this a lot. It's about like the horrors of war. It's about the old world. It's sort mm-hmm. of these these this couple. Um, visiting this strange place that they don't really understand that has these deep roots, these blood feuds. Mm-hmm. And um, I wanted to flip that and make it, make the horror, bring the horror home, mm-hmm. uh, so to speak. Yeah, I really like that choice. And uh, have it be about a conflict between, uh, an almost equally inscrutable conflict between two Americans with a foreign couple being sort of exposed to all of that. And a good analog for the horrors of war is the horrors of the American healthcare industry. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So I, I like that. Do you want to share casting choices at yes, this point? Yes, yes. So I had some some thoughts on this, and uh, I think I went a little non-traditional. I think it would be easy to, you know, you're thinking, okay, who's someone who's kind of creepy? Uh, <laughs> there are some pretty obvious picks for that, right? Um, you know, what's his name? Hannibal. Uh, sure. Mads would Mads be, Mads Mikkelsen, Mikkelsen would but, be an easy pick for one of these roles here. He's already our Dracula. He's already your Dracula. I couldn't do Mikkelsen. <laughs> and I'm I'm hoping neither of these people have been cast, and I'm fairly sure they haven't. But um, for the character of Peter Stone, who is the Lugosi equivalent yes. in this movie, I want to get Harold Perrineau. Oh, oh yeah. Interesting. Because I think... Because, I mean, I love him. He's a fantastic actor. Mm-hmm. I think he can pull the 
um, we're not we're not going for exactly the same as Lugosi. We're not going for that sure. kind of like swarthy European like. But we we want someone who can do haunted, um, mm-hmm. who can do tortured, um, who can seem kind of a little unsettling because we do want to keep that element of this character shows up and you know, your first introduction to him is he's sitting next to this this newlywed couple and is kind of maybe giving off bad vibes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they strike up a conversation with him and th- one of the first things they learn is, oh yeah, I just got out of, of jail where I was for uh, the better part of two decades. And so you're kind of like, okay, who is this guy? I haven't seen him in a role like this, but I also haven't seen Oz. So I don't know if this is at all similar mm. to the character he played in Oz. Um, but I, I feel like I haven't seen this that kind of darkness out of Harold Perrineau, but I like the idea I like of it. immediately getting on Dalton's good side with a lost cast a member. A lost cast yes, member. That, um, um, I feel like he just has the range for something like absolutely. this. It would, it'd it be, would be cool to see him some role, like this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for him to uh, to get into. And for James Foster, who is sort of the the more villainous character, mm-hmm. again, it would be easy to do kind of just like a Karloff type guy. Um, I want to move away from that, though, because I want to play up in this version, this element of this guy seeming initially to be really trustworthy and really sort of all American. And we are going to maybe listen, we are going to maybe play with the dynamic between Harold Perrineau and this uh, this cast member mm-hmm. um, and maybe play on some people's, you know, preconceptions of which characters can be trusted and which can't. I want to get John Hamm. Oh, oh interesting. that's very good. I want to get John Hamm and I want him to play this character, James Foster, as a Silicon Valley new agey type guy mm-hmm. who okay. is not a Satanist. He is, in fact, into transhumanism. He's into wellness. Sure. He's into all of these things that um, he he smiles Frequently, he's kind of the, an anti Karloff in a sense. He's Don seems, Draper at the retreat in the final episode <laughs> right. of Mad Men. He's very accommodating. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has that disarming smile. And uh, I feel like that contrast would be really interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I re- like these choices a lot. And as you were saying, yeah, playing off the like, Lugosi is the good guy, ostensibly sort of in the black cat. And by having Harold Perno being a, a, black convict essentially that you're setting up and John Hamm being America's, you know, favorite, uh, handsome man. Yeah. You're, you're playing with people's prejudices in a way, you know, and, and, uh, yeah. That's... But it's also like, I like the, the way that it kind of creates this sort of, uh, creates people's feelings that their that their expectations maybe are going to get fucked with. First of right. all, you know, it's, with John Hamm, our impression of him is this guy who is probably bad, who we all want to fuck. And then with Harold Perrineau, you have a lot of people still have bruised feelings over Michael's behavior on Lost, mm. which what? thanks to that article that came out this week as we recorded this, we now know was somewhat the fault of writers just kind of wanting to get rid of him. Right, uh, right. But uh, so, but at the same time. Genre savvy or Hollywood savvy people are gonna are gonna see the setup of you know we have the the square jaw mid century looking white man sure. and the black convict and be like well they're not gonna play this straight that's there's there's no way you're gonna maintain if we that did, dynamic we would that we would <laughs> be <laughs> fucked um, I mean also, we're, we're almost at a point I feel like in sort of the discourse where you're, it's starting to be a little bit more acceptable to be like no actually if you're a black right. actor you should get to play a villain or yeah, a fucked no, up person but, but the thing is but, about this role I do you know. I, I think it isn't just like a, a one dimensional kind of like switch off, right? Like right. I do want some of like I want some of that dark energy. I yeah. want mm-hmm. some of that like, you know, um that antagonism. He he is showing up to try to kill John Hamm. Yeah. Uh, and whether that's deserved or not, like probably. But um and for the the couple, um, so I wanted to um I you know we could have gone like European, we could have gone like, you know, hung- at first I thought Hungarian and just flip it, yeah, just totally ob- flip do the it. obvious flip. Um, but I felt like I wanted I, the hung like Eastern Europe to US doesn't feel like the same kind of thing as like US to Eastern Europe in the 30s. Right. I wanted especially if you're doing like if you want to play with like West Coast America, then it makes sense to go from the Pacific. And right. and there is an extent to which we imagine I mean, maybe this is not really the way that people in other countries think about it, but like, I think there's a sort of American mentality that when you're going to Europe, you're going back in time. Right. And that when you're going to like urban centers in Asia, you're going to the future. Sure. And yeah. so that maybe from the opposite side, it's like they're going to the the old world from right. their world. Right, right. Yeah, sort of mirroring that original dynamic. Um, so for Minjun, um, I think... 
so you know the thing is like okay we we want to we're casting Korean characters um I would ideally like them to be English speaking as well mm -hmm. which sort of you know narrows down that what is a huge field to mm -hmm. a small number of people um there's an actress named uh Kang So Ra who has been in a bunch of dramas who's been in um some who's in a um comedy based on a webtoon that did really well called um secret zoo okay came okay. out a few years ago <laughs> uh and um i think she would be great mm -hmm. and for young woo who is uh the husband um i thought we could get choi Bushik, who was in parasite oh uh he was in what else was he in he was also in Train to Busan. Oh, I, I know who you, uh, exactly and, who you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> he's been in a lot of Korean dramas. He was in one called Our Beloved Summer, which was really popular. Uh, he's actually Canadian. He's based in South Korea. Mm -hmm. He's in like a lot of Bong Joon-ho movies, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah but there's, there's yeah. some more star power too. Uh, right, right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we so have like, that's our core cast. We have like two Secret Zoo super fans listening that are just <laughs> yeah, popping like, yes! so hard. Yes! yes! Finally! Finally! Yes. <laughs> they cast someone from Secret Zoo. Um... But yeah, and uh, and so I want to yeah move away from the Satanism thing. Not, I mean, it's not really kind of like as scary as it used to be. I mean, maybe in this country now it has it's coming. We're getting Satanic Panic too, so yeah. you know we're rebooting that. But <laughs> but you know we have this thing of Karloff in the original being obsessed with with death and with sort of preservation of life. He ha I assumed when I was watching the original that he was going to be trying to bring these women back to life. And I think that is what John Hamm's character is trying to do in this movie. He is trying to defeat death. I mean, definitely, like, the, I feel like the modern version of that is, like, that it's been in the news a lot recently. Like, the guy who has a blood boy. Blood, who's, like, his, using his son. Using his son's blood. As a blood boy. Right. Like, that's, yeah. That's, um, so he is trying to do these kinds of things. But he he's also, I think, the kind of guy who is doing um, ayahuasca mm -hmm. uh, to sort of improve, you know, in the sort of very narrow way that the tech guys do it. Like, the horror here is kind of tech and drinking feels, raw water mm -hmm. right it feels like a little on the nose maybe um but i want you know i i just picture this like amazing like bizarre looking house in the desert john ham smiling face opening the door uh welcoming these people into his home and sort of grad they sort of gradually realize that something is up with this guy um and you know maybe initially he seems great right he's Mm -hmm. Um, he's into all this like great, like, oh, he's, he's does yoga. He's into all these things. And it kind of like over the course of the movie, we, re we realized like, oh, this guy is like obsessed with, uh, not dying, not dying. And with just like, uh, with technology in this way that is, uh, really frightening. Um, I also like that the couple like would, the, 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 your actual like central couple would probably be more comfortable with him. Like instead of, you know, I feel like in, in the original they go and they're like immediately like this, this place is fucked. Like this, they've just survived a plane crash with again, like this convict they don't really trust. And they go in here and they, they would probably see this as like, yeah, salvation would be very comfortable with like, Oh, he's got money. Yeah. Sort of like the kind of outside of our leftist circles. Many people admire men like this. Right, right? exactly. Yeah. It's like, well, yeah. they're, they're the superheroes. They're like our Carnegies or whatever. And they're all excited about it. And it's only once you look at them with any kind of detail that you see how fucked up it is. Yeah. And especially if you are coming into America from the outside and then you see, oh, wow, this is like the, this is, this is like meeting, as many people would say enthusiastically, this is like meeting Elon Musk. Right, right. right. Um, and it's interesting that there's been a lot of American media lately that deconstructs this type of character, right? Whether it's like in a sort of a comical, satirical way in like Glass Onion, or if you watch like Dead Ringers or Beef, sure. right? I have Where, a comic series of- And you also Dalton's entire- all takes place in Silicon Valley. Mm. <laughs> yes, uh, Monocle, M-O-N-O-C-O-U-L. M-O-N-O-C-U-L. Thank you. <laughs> uh, check it out. An anti-capitalist uh, tales of the crypt. Yeah, so I think it's interesting to... Uh, I really like the the tableau that you're setting here. So do you have... Great uh, setup. Do you have, uh, like, an idea of, like, the beat out of, of, of the plot as it goes? Or are we kind of sort of following the thread of the original? Or do you veer off? Yeah, I mean, I think we follow some of the, the similar plots um, or some of the similar beats. I think maybe the couple... Um, is initially more comfortable in the house than they were in the original. Um, and at some point, they start to kind of wig that something is up and are maybe trying to get out, but uh, are are rebuffed and mm -hmm. we sort of degenerate from there. 
Um, I, I love the image of instead of having, you know, the satanic rituals in the basement, um, he's leading these, these big, just sort of like meditation exercises that are just (laughs) really like really out there. Um, you know, I think also like there is this element of like, okay, instead of, instead of him being like, oh, I'm going to add this American woman to my collection. He's like, I'm going to add this like you know, I'm doing huge air quotes right now, like submissive Asian woman mm-hmm. to my collection. Right. Um, because American women can't be, you know, aren't or have been poisoned by feminism. <laughs> yeah. Like that's the kind of attitude this exactly. guy would have. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like, yeah. yeah. And we can um, kind of play with absolutely. the idea of that not really being present in her behavior necessarily at all. Right. Uh, right. And kind of dealing with that projection. Are we going to continue the idea that in this case, you, you mentioned that, that, um, uh, that John Hamm's character, uh, has, sort of stolen the family right. of, Harold, of Harold Perno's character. Are they, is that like out in the open here? Are they on site? Are they hidden? I think what we're going to do in this one, because in the original, we don't really know uh, what happened to the wife, right? Mm-hmm. We don't yeah. know if she just died or if she was killed. I think in this one, we can have her be sort of an early uh, casualty of John Hamm's experiments mm-hmm. okay. to extend human lifespan. Uh, so he... You know, he used her as a guinea pig. Um, she died. And maybe then he, maybe the daughter is still alive and on the site somewhere. Um, and we sort of keep that element of she's being hidden away. And he, yeah. also he's maybe done the gross thing of then he is now with her. Yeah. Um, like in the original. But I like just making that a little more explicit that like he, you know, he betray- basically betrays his friend. Mm-hmm. Um, and makes you know gets off scot-free uh we don't necessarily have to get too deep into like what that fraud was but i i you know i tried initially i was thinking okay maybe we could do the military thing still um you know if we're talking this in the current day it could be they could have been in afghanistan or iraq or something Mm -hmm. i couldn't really i'm sure there is an angle there but this feels like a little more um it's a little looser but it feels i don't know it just feel like it made more sense to me i mean it's less sticky right you don't have to yeah. try and figure out figure where the politics the is that where they were and what's yeah. happening yeah and i think there's i mean there's uh, you know as we said there's a lot of real life horrors of like healthcare to play with that like what that sort of situation was i'm wondering my first kind of idea that i'm thinking of is the daughter we you know you mentioned maybe maybe they're together like they were in the original black cat maybe is there I I don't know your vision of exactly what experiments he's doing to keep himself deathless. um, Mm. But is she like maybe the primary, like the the one person the experiments worked on and like, she's the one, she's like the primary one that's giving him this life, like the blood bag, if that's what we're doing, you know, or whatever that sort of thing is. And so it doesn't necessarily even need to have to be an explicitly sexual relationship. It could be this kind of weird dependence that he's created where like, she's sort of, She's sort of like uh, under his thumb in a certain way where she's literally keeping him alive, but not, but in a way where there's this vibe in the original that the, that the daughter is like under some kind of spell. Right. Right. And here we have the opportunity to be playing with this sort of dynamic where John Hamm's character has like sort of boosted the importance and her esteem of like, you're, you're creating the future, but it's also created a codependency where she doesn't feel like she can get out of it. Because mm. she's she is literally keeping him alive and doesn't feel as if she can go anywhere or live her own life because he needs like doses of her blood or spinal fluid or whatever sure. any at a particular intervals and so she's still in that sort of situation where she's kept but she can maybe be more of a character. Well, right, yeah. There's obviously also the sort of race dynamic yeah. of that as yeah. well with this Silicon Valley person again. May, maybe I, I hadn't thought of this, but like you said, maybe convinced her like that he's a mentor almost, you know, Mm, that uh like she is doing good work, but like the sort of oppression and subjugation built into that from this white, rich Silicon Valley person that is preying on her body and, you know, her uh, mind and then promising her things that he never intends to fulfill. Meanwhile, whose name's on the label, right? Right. Yeah, Yeah, no, I like the idea that she is... Um, more of a character, and and I hadn't I hadn't really thought of that to be honest, but that makes total sense. She's more of a character, and she is, um, yeah, like a co uh, researcher or, or like a scientist in her own right, and mm-hmm. um, you know, is maybe even one of the primary drivers of this stuff. Yeah, um, 
and bringing, yeah, bringing her in as more of a, cause you know, Karen in the original is in like a couple of scenes and then kills off screen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we don't have a lot of other than like, oh, this poor woman, we don't get to have a lot of investment in her. And again, I think a lot of that has to do with like 65 minutes. You really right. don't have a lot of room. Yeah. And we're gonna I go imagine a this is going to be a much longer film. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, this also will introduce the tension of maybe when they do find her, when she finds out that her dad is alive, maybe she doesn't want to go, you know, like there's right. like, because she has some amount of, you know, brainwashing or promises that have been made. And there's a little tension between her and the father. It well, introduces a lot of dynamics. As far as everyone dynamics. else is concerned, Har- Harold Perno's character was like the villain in their right. story. Right. Yes. And she's been, she has been uh, raised now by John Hamm's character and believes that she's now working towards a purpose. And maybe some of the work that she's doing would maybe have saved her mother. And she blames her father for her death. Yeah. And now, and she's kind of been, she's made peace with his death and now he's back. Right. And it's a yeah. complication for her. But these are suggestions. Yeah. We don't no. need to overtake your pitch. No, but, but no, that totally, you know, yeah. This guy who you have, you know, maybe she's in her twenties, like early twenties or mm-hmm. something. And, um, you know, if he's been in jail for most of her life, yeah. And you've be- effectively been raised by this other person like that. That's like a, you know, it's funny that my mind where my mind goes to, but I'm like, just like in the D and D movie. No, I was just thinking that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I saw it fairly recently, but yeah, it's that same kind of thing. Right. Of mm-hmm. like, yeah, if you're being raised by someone like, yeah, they're, they have a power over you. And you, if they misuse that, then it's going to come out in a bad way. So maybe this movie will fit into the Dungeons and Dragons universe. Instead <laughs> yeah. Of the dark universe. Yeah. Oh. yeah. No. Um, ah, belt. Who's that? Oh, it's Paramount. Paramount's knocking. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Uh, Great. So do you have an idea of how you want this to resolve? Do you... Yeah, so... Or if you have more things, uh, yeah. li- not to skip to the end, if you had more uh, Yeah, no, I mean, cover. I think it's a lot of it is going to follow similar similar mm-hmm. kinds of beats. Um, I'm not sure if the... I mean, I like the chess element. Um, that could be switched out for something else. The, the, the chess mind battle yeah i mean what's the silicon valley equivalent of that you know like oh yeah they're just gonna they're gonna play dota for, <laughs> for this, this woman's soul uh no no i think chess is pretty timeless in that yeah. kind of way and especially um remember when like elon musk was like saying that he doesn't play chess because like the gameplay is too like simple like these like there, there's not uh, like <laughs> there's no dragons in this well yeah he like wanted like other like mechanism it was i'm going so to invent it's chess too classic dumb chess guy has stuff. already been invented it's on steam <laughs> <laughs> yeah but like they some sort of uh yeah battle of wills yeah kind of thing i like that and again keeping it to like the psychological horror of it um right i'm also getting like wicker man vibes from this mm. like a sort of like you know these sort of outsiders coming into like this compound that's right. like very positive and happy and free with yeah. like you know dark stuff under the surface it's right it's kind sort of a time honored yeah kind of pattern um yeah so i mean there's no bomb in the basement but <laughs> we're uh, gonna change that yes there is that. i mean we can maybe i mean i'm trying to you know because I, I like the the house collapsing like the you know the sins of this place being mm-hmm. destroyed um and maybe that is like you know maybe there is like a lot of like weird equipment that is part of this, this these experiments that are going on and and that could just be like movie magic overloaded or whatever <laughs> um but i like the idea of the the daughter getting away in this one too mm-hmm. yeah of her i don't es- think we should kill the daughter no of no. her escaping with the couple i think you know um john ham and harold perno i think they both have to die mm-hmm. um for the sort of sins of the fathers, well, of mostly just John Hamm, yeah. <laughs> uh, to sort of be be erased. But um, but I like the idea of the three of them making it out this time. And you know, I think the daughter too, like making her more of a character means we don't really need the um, the like Porter, or the, like the the assistant character yeah. guy um, in the original, which is nice economy. Yes, there. Um, I am thinking that. Whether we blow up the building or not, <laughs> which we don't have to. Uh, I feel like we need some sort of, what is our flaying scene? You know, like mm. what's, I, I do think like it is something yes, about yeah. the black cat. Like it's so much of that psychological tension. And then so, this sudden like explosion of like incongruous violence uh, mm-hmm. that like seems out of place for the 30s. Like what is, uh, what is John Hamm's sort of end? Like his come up, right. you know, how do we find something that's like comparable um, I mean, we could just make it flaying. Uh, I don't but, think it's but, just flaying. No, I think it has something to do with the technology yeah. he's been using to live long, I feel like his life. It's, Drained you know, of blood, you know, exsanguinated. Maybe he's getting exsanguinated. 
Um, but that isn't really gruesome, mm -hmm. like visually. Um, I mean, does, I guess it depends on how you show it. Like that's uh, true. Well, there's an image from Star Trek Insurrection uh, where yes. Um, there's I found a way to talk about Star Trek on this episode. Um, where um, there's I don't a, think you did on Bride and Frankenstein. I did that not. Might have been our first episode with no Star Trek reference. There yeah. was uh, there is a, a species there where they're obsessed with keeping themselves young, and they have this like flesh stretching machine that they pull. They mm. use it to pull their pull their faces back and staple them tight. Ooh. And then one of the guy and uh, this Starfleet admiral gets murdered that way. They put him into the machine and they just kind of pull his skin back. And the implication is that he basically just chokes on the tightness of his own face. Okay, that's not bad. I, like and I that. feel like, like we, could, we could do a full body version I of was that. Gonna, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was gonna say something about you know, um, some like he's he's got him like you know strapped onto a table and he's injecting like. Uh, acid into his muscles or something, oh, just like yeah. syringing, just something. Um, but yeah, the stretching, the 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 like facelift of hell. Yeah, put I, him in the skin tightener. <laughs> I like your idea though too. Like, what if part of his process is having certain like toxins removed from his body, mm. and then what his death is is gets all of them back at once and just kind of melts him from the inside out. What about this sort of uh, combination where? It, we do the full body skin stretching, but in order for it to work, he like, he injects like sort of like acid into his muscles that like stiffens them. So he's like excruciatingly like tense and like his whole body is like kind of splayed out and that allows like it paralyzes him basically. So he can't fight. He can't, you know, pull back on it. He's already I mean, in pain. And then they get, put the clamps on his skin, you know, an even simpler solution. Botox. Mm. Ooh, Botox, like, no, I mean, over-injection? Well, I mean, because Botox is just poison. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. it just does kill muscles. Um, and so that is maybe how he sets him up for the, the face stretching. There we go. Uh, is he just, like, pumps him full of Botox. And uh, I love this. Yeah. In terms of directors, I, mm -hmm. I have to admit, I don't know a lot of contemporary film directors so i had this is hard for me too i had a thought i don't know that he's actually the best guy given the direction that we've sort of gone in um i wasn't actually a huge fan of barbarian but i saw you know promise in it and i feel like a zach Kreger could do interesting things with this but now that we've moved in this direction I'm not sure he's actually the best. I don't know. I, I, I think like that. He directs the hell out of that movie. He like does. it's shot he really beautifully. Oh, yeah, right? it's just, yeah. I think the script is where it. Did he write it as well? I think so, but okay. I'm not sure. I had a thought. This just throwing out there. What about Brandon Cronenberg? Okay. Now, granted, Bo the body horror stuff. Body horror and, stuff. Yeah. Infinity sort of, Pool kind of deals with some of. I mean, is it, is it too much of a retread? No, not at all. Because it feels like it's thematically kind of locked in with his thing. It is very mm. thematically similar yeah. to Infinity Pool, um, but I don't think like a retread at all. I think yeah. just kind of in his wheelhouse. Yeah, I think both okay. of those are good picks. I am getting that that feeling where it's like, fuck, this would be really cool to see this movie. And I have a. Uh... If you want to connect this to the dark universe, oh please yes, do. This, yes, I think absolutely. I think you don't mention it at all during the. We do an Ant Man too. You okay. don't mention it at all that there's mm -hmm. this other stuff happening, and um, then you do the thing which got me to never watch another Marvel movie again <laughs> at the end of at, in the post credit scene of Ant Man too, um, which is there's a post credit scene where we find out that James Foster was actually hooked up with Prodigium the whole time. Hmm. And doing research for them. And right? he is maybe reviving or keeping alive in suspended animation someone who is important to them. Okay. Well, okay, so here's some thoughts. That's, that's not bad. The idea of trying to cheat death is very important to our mythology because we have established that, like, basically there's just hell and nothing else when you die. <laughs> uh, cool. And then, and a lot of people who have been, who are undead now have experienced that. Dracula's motivation in House of Dracula is that he wants to become the god of death so he can make sure that even as an immortal, he can't be touched because he fears some greater, he fears the rise of hell on earth. Mm -hmm. And that certainly makes the research that John Hamm's character is doing here uh, relevant to the interests of a lot of our characters. Mm, yeah. Okay. This could be a Dracula tie-in. Yeah. Oh, it's actually, um, there's, okay, yeah. it's actually like there's something I'm working on in Dracula Lives that like is not incompatible with this. Uh, at least on a thematic level. Uh, I mean, I could see there being like a division of Prodigium because Prodigium also is aware of this uh, death's door problem. Yeah. Um, I could see them being like, well, we're kind of 
throwing everything at the wall, what if we have like one guy who's just figuring out how to get rid of death altogether? Like right. that is kind yeah. of a solution. Like if, it's, if it's just one of those dies. like sort of <laughs> yeah. like siloed projects, like the Black Lagoon exactly, monitoring, which is very um, where I yeah I think it I think it could fit, and then like we don't oh, and that potentially makes the daughter a MacGuffin of sorts for mm. the other characters because she's now with the place. Let's suppose that we do blow up the house. Right. <laughs> um, she in her cells now has the only surviving specimen. She's got the Captain America of, super soldier of serum. this right. sort of formula, which perhaps we'd call the black cat because yes, that's it how, gives you that's more right. lives. Yeah. And that means that now everyone will be after her. The black cat program is like the name of the right. Because, okay. because it will make because it makes you deathless like evil. Oh, shit, this is good. Actually, <laughs> uh, see, this is this is the fun of the show. Uh, yeah, I'm. I, I am, mean, which yeah, like you said, makes sense because of the nine lives thing. They're figuring out a way to give people mm-hmm. additional lives. The Black Cat program. That's good. And that's of course, good. there's the. Do we save that for the post credits reveal where we don't know it's called that, and then it? I mean, if it's the name of the movie, I feel like we do need to put well, it in there. Is it the name of the movie? That's a, that's a question for that you. That is. Mary. I mean. Did you have any like alternate now, titles in mind? Not really. I mean, beyond Bad Vibes House, which is, <laughs> it's, it hasn't tested great so far. Um, but I think we can keep that if that's what we do with, you know, if we call if we call this serum or this project the Black Cat Project. Um, I like that. I'm I'm thinking because the Black Cat Project, I think, is very in line with what Prodigium would call something. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's a Silicon Valley name for something. So is it maybe like... John Hamm has like his surface company, you know, like whatever mm. his Apple or Tesla or whatever is. And then like they discover like, oh, the basement was where I'm working on the black. Maybe it's like there's even like a more techie name for it, but it's like right. everyone just calls it the black cat program mm-hmm. or like mm-hmm. that's, you know, what the people involved are calling in and stuff. OK, um, just trying to figure out a way to square that with John Hamm's sort of right. like ayahuasca persona i you know yeah, it this more yeah. sort of gothic name but i think we can make that work yeah i think that works so we're still calling it the black cat okay all right okay all right this is this is exciting i think then we can put a black cat in the movie they okay. have a little yeah. lab mascot it doesn't sure. have to have necessarily a plot you and know. we can just have a character be like, oh, those things creep me out. What and if then, it's the and then all the fans cat. of the original Black Cat will be like, that's right! <laughs> it's the daughter's cat. We give the, okay. you know, yeah. that sort of, you know, mm-hmm. maybe even helps her out at one point mm-hmm. in a, like a non-Disney movie oh, way. But. Yeah. Okay, this is probably too much. It's probably a hat on a There's hat. There's no such thing. Maybe the cat is the first successful test subject. And that's why uh, it's called that. Okay. Um, that like, they did animal testing first. Yeah, they did animal yeah, testing first. And the first, the first kind of thing that the daughter brings back to life with the with the with her experimental fluids or blood or whatever is her cat, uh, and that's why it's the black cat project she, because yeah. she gave it its second life. Right. She did that in uh, she did that like in college at you know MIT or whatever, and <laughs> that's how John Hamm discovered her. Right. You know, or, and like I mean, it could also be that depending on the timeline of this thing, depending on how long Harold Perrineau has been in jail, like he put her through college. Right. And he has right. sort of one of those things where it's like, well, your research is owned by me because yeah. I'm paying yeah. for yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah. And then she has to kind of play the thing being like, well, you know, I'm in the family business. It's, And meanwhile, he gets to take everything and... I'm fascinated now, and I am feeling that frustration of yeah. Let's we should we should develop <laughs> this, this. We should let's develop this project. Let's yeah. let's write our fifty-page scriptment yeah. of it. You know. <laughs> uh, so yeah, Merritt, do you have anything else you want to add to your pitch? Um, I think that's it. I think we are going to drop the soundtrack. We're going to do a different. I'm not sure. I'm open to suggestions, but I think we are. It's safe to say we're not going to do. Although we might have someone play the first like measure. Of the Bach. Yeah. Of the Bach, yeah. It's Absolutely. someone's ringtone and they're like, that's so yeah. annoying. We do that stupid meta thing. Just like, that's so annoying. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, love that. Yeah, no Tchaikovsky this time. Or or like one of the quirks of like John Hamm's character, like that classic evil villain thing. Mm. Like, I love my classical records, you know. <laughs> Um, oh, I was going to say one big uh, common denominator between Karloff and John Hamm. Very rectangular heads. Yes. I think yes. we've got that's, good rectangular maybe that's head energy. Subconsciously, I was like, if mm-hmm. we had a shot of him in, in profile, like shape. sitting up in bed, it would basically be the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Now, all right. So here's the moment of truth. Dylan, this does not contradict any existing Dark Universe lore. And I think actually thematically ties in pretty yeah. well with our three phase plans yeah i think i think we throw this i think we throw this into development i think so too i think we throw this in as uh for development as a phase three movie you Mm -hmm. know i think it it's 
obviously not like uh, a direct like it's not one of uh, uh, our mainline entries because it's not a monster movie. It's not one of those. But I feel like we can release this as a Dark Universe branded film yeah. uh, and put it yes. in development. You know, we'll have to see a script. Yes, yeah, we'll have to see a script. Of course, first. Of, course <laughs> of course. But yeah, it's, we can we can uh, we can throw it on the wiki. And in that case, I think we can call it Picture Lock. Yeah, hit the button. It's alive. All right, Mary, have, thank you so much for, for coming yeah, in and doing this. Yes. Yeah. We have an addition to the dark universe now, uh, suggested by Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have anything that you'd like to to, to tell our uh, listeners about what's going on in your life? Yeah, mainly mainly just the book. Um, like you mentioned earlier, I have a book coming out called Land Party. I think you can still pre-order it. I think it comes out in the fall. I'm not sure of the exact date. But uh, if you haven't pre-ordered that and you're interested in it, then get on that. It's basically a coffee table book with photos of land parties, mainly from the 2000s and from the 2010s. And I wrote a big intro to it. There's a bunch of essays from games industry people like Josh Sawyer. So, yeah, it's a very, very cool project. It's been a little while in the making and um, it should be cool. Awesome. Can't wait. Where can people follow you online? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Mary Kay pretty much everywhere except on Instagram where that was taken. So Merit K9 in there, which is <laughs> weird because I don't have a dog or anything. <laughs> um, but, uh, I'm also on Blue Sky, which who knows if yeah. that'll stick around. Oh, which so by we're, the way, so are we now? Dylan and I yeah. are on Blue Sky, oh, so congrats. you can follow us on there. Okay. Um, I think same handles for both of yep. us. It's just D-Y-L-A-N-R-O-T-H. Yeah. And my name, <laughs> which is harder to spell, but <laughs> you can find it in the show notes, I'm sure. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, now all that's left for us to do in this episode is to handle a little bit of uh, we've been putting off the mailbag portion yes. of the show because our pitches have been going for over two hours on the main line of the show. And I apologize so, for that. I mean, me too. I mean, honestly, no, we shouldn't apologize. No, because they, they kick ass. The people like it. We work hard we for think. you guys <laughs> <laughs> writing, writing our 50 page scriptments in like six weeks. And if you've been enjoying those pitches and want to support us, uh, you can check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Dylan and Dalton and get access to our lovely Discord full of uh, wonderful and welcoming people who want to talk about horror movies and all about our shows and our projects and their own projects. And there is now a free trial function on Patreon. If you want to check that out, you can subscribe and get seven free days of uh, access to uh, our Discord and soon, hopefully, our second podcast stream are you afraid of dylan and dalton pop in make sure the vibe is good i promise you the discord vibe is good uh it does not have cursed vibes house uh (laughs) this movie it is a lot of fun Mm -hmm. um but now you can try it for seven days uh and if you start your trial on a day that one of these episodes airs then you will also get to join us for one of our weekend uh watch parties on Mm -hmm. the weekends when we don't have new episodes out because the show is bi-weekly we get together on the discord and watch an old horror movie together and it's super fun Maybe a certain black cat film would be on the table. Yeah, you know it would be if it were in the public domain. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, an so, anonymous movie. We that just won't may say what movie is going to be on the suggested show. Suggested by Edgar Allan Poe. But yeah, you up. can hang out in the chat while while uh, Dalton and I talk through the movie and just have a good time. We always have a, we always just always have fun, and it's just a great crew. So here's what some of our listeners have had to say recently. Uh, questions for us. Oh. Uh, first, some thoughts from uh, our about our. Episode. Okay. Twitter user goodboy underscore red loved the idea of the snake people and wonders if we could use them as a conduit to get to the elder gods. That's a good idea. The thing with the elder gods um, is I feel like that would be a uh, what am it's I thinking? It's a whole of? other kind of uh, phase of our story. Yeah, a right? whole other saga, saga. Right. Yeah. We're we're kind of in the middle of our death's door saga right now, and. Who knows? Maybe that'll have room for elder gods. We haven't fit worked out all the details, but like, it's definitely something we would want to build a lot of runway to. Mm -hmm. And yes, like maybe that's the kind of thing we could tease in a post credit scene uh, and make Merit hate the dark universe (laughs) as as we tease the Cthulhu uh, crossover that happens, you know, 10 movies from now. But I'm I'm personally a little burned out on, on Lovecraftian uh, like cosmic horror uh, because it's, it's used I mean, I guess we're now on the other side of it. It was everywhere for a period of time. It's also during really what we might call like the do, epic right? bacon years of the internet. But yeah. it's so. But yeah, it's, I mean, it's a good idea. No, it's, I'm not I'm not putting you down, uh, good boy, red at all. But, but just the, it's you know who knows if we can make it fit. Yeah, I, I think it definitely something down the road. 
Uh, Instagram user ProudFirestorm671 thinks it would be very cool if Regina Hall's character from Your Invisible Man eventually came back as the Invisible Woman. I think that's a good idea as well. Um, that is something to think about. I would love to get Regina Hall back. Her role was sort of so specific in that because she just, I think, worked at the casino. Right, but, so we haven't uh, had an opportunity to bring her back. But, I mean, we do theoretically have another Invisible Man picture. We haven't done in, an Invisible in Man 2 yet. Right, because, yeah, so. yeah. So, you know, we'll we'll see what happens there. That's that's an interesting idea. In response to our Gabby Utterson character spotlight post, um, if you're not following our Twitter and Instagram, we make these little character cards about each of the figures that recur in our universe with little bios and uh, unlicensed photos of the actors we chose to play them. Um <laughs> Michael Kinchlow says that they imagine that Gabby is the lead of like the first dark universe TV series that sort of like has a like a week after week uh, like problem of the week yeah. uh, that she's trying to solve in, in her in her PI thing. And I've been charmed by that idea because I'm thinking that, that she does not really have any specific ties to the supernatural community apart from having hung out with Jekyll and Hyde that one time. Mm-hmm. But then every episode on the show, she's like, OK, I'm doing a regular case about regular people. And then some ghost shit happens. And she's like. Why is this following me? And then they spend like an entire season of the show just waiting for like just one normal thing where someone's just having an affair and she needs to take pictures. Uh, So Um, that would be fun. But I will say, no spoilers, but we also have an idea already for our very first TV spinoff, which we will, I think, get to in phase three. We'll talk about it in phase three. Yeah. So keep your ears open for that. Um, And finally, a question from uh, Joseph Angel on Instagram. Uh, talking about how we've highlighted a number of indie directors as directors in Phase 2, which is cool, but brings me to my question, says Joseph Angel. They don't have to be directors of Phase 2, but are there some directors that are lesser known that you just would like to recommend to listeners? Ooh. um, I feel like this is more of a you question. Uh, Like I've said on the show, I'm so bad. I always have to seek out the directors for these movies because, especially contemporary directors, like... I'm mostly watching movies that, as we just talked about before we taped, I've seen eight movies from 2023 (laughs) so far. Not very many. So uh, I'm going to leave this one to you. I I don't have anything off the top of my head. I'm just going to make one recommendation because I've just been thinking about this movie recently. Uh, Chad Hardigan is an uh, an Irish-American, born in Cyprus. I'm just learning that he's born in Cyprus. That's fascinating. Why is that fascinating? I don't cut know. Cut it. Cut it. <laughs> Chad Hardigan is the director of one of my favorite movies from uh, sort of over the, the height of the pandemic called Little Fish, um, which is a really devastating sci-fi infused romance about living through the living through a pandemic that destroys memory. Uh, and it's like you're following this couple through their relationship in a nonlinear fashion as one of them is struggling with the loss of of his memory uh, and like trying to sustain a relationship when only one of them is all the way there. And it's just, God, it's heartbreaking. It's really effective. Uh, and it makes me really want to see anything more that Chet Hardigan makes in the future. So that's, that's going to be my recommendation. Please check out little fish. It's an IFC movie. So it is on Hulu in the United States and check out this little guy named Steven Spielberg. <laughs> He's got some good horror gonna go stuff far. in the works. Yeah. All right, I think that brings us, um, uh, all that's left for me to do is to announce that uh, ahead of Dracula Lives in mm-hmm. two weeks, uh, I have selected the director. Uh, I The first decision I made about this movie is who the director was going to be, and even though the project has completely changed, director still I'm works? keeping the director. Okay. Um, I've picked Timo Tajanto, who is the Indonesian director of uh, The Night Comes For Us, okay. which is like a really gnarly gangster action movie. Shit, uh, I need that to see just that. fucking rocks, as well as a couple of horror movies on Shutter that I have not watched yet and will while I'm working on my script. Okay. Uh, so check out, uh, he also directed a Netflix action comedy called The Big Four, which was less my thing. Okay. But uh, I, I'm so in love with The Night Comes For Us. It is very much in the style of The Raid and features some of the cast members from The Raid. Uh, and uh, and that rounds out no white dude directors in phase two. We've made it. Oh, wait, we still have The Dark Legion too. Sure. And I have some thoughts about that, but we'll get there. Yeah. Uh, anyway, thank you all for listening to this episode of Are You Afraid of the Dark Universe? And uh, we will see you in two weeks with Dracula Lives. Thanks again to our guest, Merritt Kay, uh, mm-hmm. for a really exciting pitch that uh, maybe we'll talk about more in another episode. Everyone go watch The Black Cat. Indeed. Well, Until next time, stay, stay afraid, afraid of, of the, the dark, dark universe. universe. Bye. Bye.